Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. At the end of the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1. Now we'll turn the meeting over to Mr. Fred Rank. Sir, you may begin. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, with the start time that we have of 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time, uh, we know that we're spanning four time zones. And so it, for some of you, it's good afternoon, and for some of you, it's good morning. As we get started with today's webinar on HSM applications to rural, two-lane, highway intersections, I want to call your attention to the file poll, the poll in the upper right corner. And if you'd be so kind, uh, we have 145 lines in attendance today. If you could please uh, note and click on how many people are participating on your call in line that are with you in the room today for this webinar. It would be helpful for so that we can get an idea of how many people are participating, how many people are participating in this, the uh, fifth webinar in a series of 12 on the Highway Safety Manual applications. I'll give you a moment or two here to click on the poll in the upper right-hand corner of your screen in our welcoming uh, room. And Gene, whenever you'd like to, let's move over to the presentation room and get started today. OK. Today's webinar on the Highway Safety Manual webinar series is on HSM application for two-lane rural highway intersections. In many ways, today's webinar probably is the richest in terms of the total amount of information available. Um, the information in the Highway Safety Manual for Rural Two-Lane Roads and Rural Two-Lane Road inter Highway Intersections uh, was some of the very first developed for what today we know as the new Highway Safety Manual. The first of three sessions of the day's webinar will be on the background and introduction to rural highway intersection safety. I'm Fred Rank. I'm a safety engineer with FHWA's Resource Center in the safety and design team. Also with me today will be on the uh, helping present the webinar will be Gene Apparano, also of our FHWA Resource Center safety and design team. The outcomes for this first session are to review the safety performance, that is the crash frequency performance of two-lane rural highway intersections, and to cover a subject that seems to perplex and confound many engineers out in practice, the how does subsidy safety and the subsidy safety philosophy differ from the previous ways of identifying what we call nominal safety associated with meeting the minimum requirements of a set of design standards, such as in your state design standards or in the national MUTCD or in AASHTO's policy on geometric design. Overall, for all roadways, highway fatalities in 2008 were the lowest since the 1950s. The number of fatalities, the rate in 1990 was 2.08 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. In, the, in 2005, when we suffered 43,510 fatalities, the rate had declined because million vehicle miles traveled of exposure continues to increase, was down to 1.46. In 2008, this lowest number of highway fatalities since the 1950s of 37,261, well, that is a rate of 1.25. And it's the lowest that we've seen in the United States in terms of highway safety ever. Much of it may be linked to the recession and the lessening of exposure, uh, the amount of lessening of the amount of travel out in the United States on the nation's roads and highways due to the economic climate that we're currently in. 
but there are certainly other factors. And I'm sure that the highway researchers will have a great time working through what they think were the associated linkages as they dissect this a couple of years from now. What we do know for intersections, 2008, is that stop and no control intersections, along with signalized intersections, and the other unclassified crashes for intersections, well, these, these percentages of total crashes amount to around 55% of all crashes. Fatal and injury crashes summed together account for about 57%. Overall, intersection crashes account for 21% of total highway fatalities. The majority of highway fatalities continue to be roadway departure associated with run off the road and horizontal curves. But in terms of total crashes and fatal and injury crashes combined, intersections contribute the largest numbers, even though intersections are such a small, small part of our overall highway system. In terms of rural intersections, stop yield control intersections, the primary crash type is angle crashes, but for signalized intersections, it's rear end crashes. Intersections constitute only a small part of our highway system in rural areas, rural highways. Rural intersections account for 30% of all crashes in rural areas. Some key things for you, the practitioner, to keep in mind. As much as we've learned and that we know today, the exercise of engineering judgment continues to be a essential part of our profession. Just because you comply with the nominal requirements of a state design standard or a standard for traffic operations, such as the MUTCD, doesn't necessarily guarantee that the highway or the intersection will have the lowest crash frequency possible. Rather, some important features of highways are not determined by standards, such as large radiuses associated with separate right turn lanes. The photograph illustrates this very point, uh, that sweeping the large radius right turn lanes are associated with high no crash frequency due to the fact of the, how the driver making the turn need, has to look back over the shoulder in the search behavior uh, to see if the lane is clear before entering it, and the following vehicle behind also looking uh, back over the shoulder and then rear-ending the vehicle in front of them. For this reason, and this is to beyond the state design standards and the point of this, uh, of this slide, is that the safety crash frequency performance of large radius right turn lanes, not normally determined by standards, but yet we know that they have a large, high, higher than expected crash frequency. The, our way of practicing engineering as a transportation professional has, is changing, has changed. Prior to 1995, we thought of safety as in terms of nominal safety. And nominal means in name. And if we met the minimum values of our state design standards, our agency's design standards, of the National Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, we associated that with a certain level of safety performance, uh, a certain level of expected crash frequency. In the mid-1990s, a new way and a, that's in addition to nominal safety was created, arose, based on crash analysis and the science of safety associated with highway geometrics and operational features. And that is known as the subsidy, as subsidy safety or the subsidy safety philosophy. ASHTO has embraced, adopted the subsidy safety philosophy it's incorporated into the editions of the Green Book. Uh, you can look in the third paragraph of the forward, and it reads very clear that those locations, although they may be nominally less than the desired minimum value, as long as their safety performance is not adverse, may remain in place and not, do not necessarily need to be reconstructed just because they're nominally short of a minimum value. It is very typical now that we find 
that substantive safety is a normal part of the practice of engineering. It's incumbent upon us in the transportation profession to know where crashes are occurring, how they're occurring, and incorporate that knowledge into our work in projects and in, in making recommendations for improvements. To illustrate, nominal safety typically has been based on research and operational experience of an agency. Um, it, for that reason, the minimum levels in state design standards tend to lag behind and take a, quite a bit of work to update and to modernize. But typically, the values for minim, nominally for design and state design standards tend to lag behind where what the level of knowledge we have in terms of operations and safety by 10 to 15 years. Hopefully, in your state, it's less than that. We assume that if we satisfy these values, we're providing a consistent level of quality to a project. These uh, standard values are typically reflective of general cost effectiveness. So I would like you to think of nominal safety, meeting the minimum value for the length of the tangent, for a taper, for, a, uh, for warranting of left turn lanes or lighting, is a first step. It's not the last step. It's just the first step. And do you meet that or, or do you not? Beyond that first step is where we look at subsidy safety and uh, practicing the subsidy safety philosophy. For example, for this rural always stop location, on the left, we have a stop sign placed far out to the right. So it's the, to the right of the right turn lane. But it's largely out of view of the driver and the approach. In the right-hand example, we have a stop sign that's placed in the Pork Chop Island, more central in the driver's attention window. In the first step, we meet the nominal requirement of the MUTCD, that a stop sign is placed to the right of the lane it controls. And typically associated with that application, we would think of it as a crash modification of 1.00. If, in fact, in a second step, this is going beyond meeting the nominal requirement, we add in an additional supplementary stop sign with a beacon in a pork chop island more central in the driver's approach attention window, we know we can enhance the visibility, enhance the conspicuity, and have the lowest amount of driver error on seeing and observing the place stop sign. Associated with that would be an expected an 11% crash reduction. In the second example, on the left-hand side from Upper Michigan, a rural state highway with a cross intersection ahead. On the right in the photograph is the image of a also of a rural highway in Illinois in which a left turn lane has been added in the center of the rural road at a cross intersection. First step is no left turn lane. There, most states do not have warrants or requirements or minimum values as to where they place left turn lanes for safety. Typically, their left turn lanes have been placed in the past based on uh, operational need and uh, based on capacity. Second step is incorporating the subsidy safety philosophy. Adding a left turn lane will accomplish a crash reduction of 48%. The addition of a left turn lane for the through uncontrolled approach to a cross intersection is one of the most powerful safety measures that can be done for rural intersections. Additional high payoff measures for rural intersections are advanced warning signs and lighting. The new Highway Safety Manual of 2010 an AASHTO product currently in the process of being printed by AASHTO as their publication is been developed and prepared in a like manner to that that was done for the Highway Capacity Manual illustrated on the left. And it works in largely the same way as the Highway Safety the, the Capacity Manual is also structured. The methodology is like the Highway Capacity Manual in that it provides to you, the transportation professional, a set of tools to make informed decisions that you may choose in a project. 
The HSM will allow you to understand and better quantify highway safety performance, that is crash frequency performance for informed and balanced decision making. Like the Highway Capacity Manual, the HSM describes mathematical relationships for crash frequency performance based upon exposure and conditions. It's a set of analysis tools only, just like the Highway Capacity Manual. The Highway Safety Manual does not have standards nor best practice guidance. The HSM does not supersede other publications that do, like the M Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or the AASHTO Green Book on a policy on geometric design of highways and streets. The HSM describes mathematical relationships for known safety performance. It's in a set of analysis tools only. It's not like the MUTCD nor the Green Book. So the HSM is a set of tools for prediction of crash frequency and analysis. And then we can apply crash modification factors to the predicted crash frequency to account for conditions for our site where they may differ from the assumed base conditions of the crash prediction formula. The HSM will facilitate explicit consideration of safety throughout the project development process, whether it be in project uh, identification, be it in uh, scoping in the actual design or in the actual or in the uh, evaluation afterwards. One of the great strengths of the Highway Safety Manual is it is a synthesis of validated highway safety research, and it brings together hundreds, if not thousands, of research projects together in one synthesized, comprehensive document. This HSM of 2010 that's currently being printed for delivery out to those of you who have ordered it, uh, is the best known of the safety research. And it provides analytical tools that be for prediction of the impact of decisions on road safety. It has extensive information on how to screen and how to do economic uh, analysis of benefits for highway safety evaluations. So the Highway Safety Manual contains the best of the science and research all put together into one book. We have for some time been able to evaluate quantitatively environmental impacts, operationally uh, impacts with the HCM, the Highway Capacity Manual. Certainly can do the economic analysis of benefits to cost. And the Highway Safety Manual now allows us and will be the, the best tool for evaluating safety impacts and safety differences. So how can crash prediction be used? First of all, at the program level, in screening to prioritize segments and locations to become projects, at the project level, to assess the relative needs for a project, and within a project, to identify the elements that can be approved and how much reduction in crash frequency would each of those decisions expect to result in. It can communicate the relative needs to the public. As a longtime practitioner uh, at the local level, I've used it is probably the best tool that to uh, with the public. I've used its predecessors in the McCoy equations as well as the ones from IHSDM in their early days in dealing with the public and their concerns about safety. They work quite remarkably effectively, far better than other approaches. It allows you to prioritize the work to keep a project within its budget, which is so important today. You can, and it is possible, and I know of some individuals have used it successfully already, even before it's been formally published. If you've used it as a way to document your process in a quantifying the relative safety of a site, of a location, and demonstrating that the agency, your agency, addressed crash frequency needs appropriately. I would like you to keep in mind that FHWA, in a program memorandum back in January of 2005, stated to one and all in federal projects 
objects, that it's the policy of the Federal Highway Administration that safety must be fully considered in every aspect. Planning, programming, environmental analysis, project design, construction, maintenance, and operations. So in your interactions on any project that involves federal funding, keep in mind that FHWA is looking for an assessment of safety. We would urge you to use the Highway Safety Manual as the one of the best set of tools for your analysis of considering safety. By using the Highway Safety Manual, you can then include considerations of safety in the overall decision making in a project. And by the way, it's a requirement within any federal aid project. So in this first session, we've introduced to you uh, overall safety and of rural two-lane highway intersections and some aspects of substantive safety and nominal safety. Please keep in mind that the human being in the driving task is a visual animal. And processing most of that information, which comes visually, the human brain is a parallel processor. The human beings in the driving task routinely err. And it's the inherent nature of the human brain in the driving task because it's a parallel processor. From the same information seen visually, where most of the information it comes from as a source, the branching to a decision can go on different paths. And some of the times, they end up at a selection of something that's incorrect. So the inherent nature of the human being in the driving task is human beings will make errors. You and I as engineers can't prevent that totally. How we design and build a road can reduce the amount of errors and how we present information. We can affect, will the chance of that human error result in a crash? And we certainly affect the severity of, those, of the consequences of crashes. How you design a piece of highway or a rural two-lane highway intersection and how it's operated affects both the number and the severity of crashes. And the Highway Safety Manual well documents the best practice to reduce crashes. So what can the Highway Safety Manual do for you? Think of it as a way to predict the crash frequency performance of geometric design features. Think of it as a way to quantitatively calculate crash frequency expected as a basis of ADT or exposure, to be able to predict crash frequency for intersections as well as highways. And you can use the Highway Safety Manual to do all of these things and assist you technically in your project. The net result should be better decisions for safety. So in this first session, we reviewed safety performance of two-lane rural highway intersections and illustrated and described to you how subsidy safety goes beyond nominal safety. And with that, I would like to turn it over and to Gene Apparano, who will present to you predicting crash frequency for two-lane rural intersections. Thank you, Fred. Welcome, everyone. This particular session is session two of three. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through the process of predicting crashes for two-lane rural intersections. Now we're going to talk briefly about some quantitative safety research on intersections. But more importantly, we're going to show you what the SPF, or the safety performance function base models are for intersections, and walk you through the process of a crash prediction frequency for intersections on a rural two-lane highway. What you're going to see here in the exhibits and tables that we show uh, are tables that are from the last draft version of the final HSM, uh, final draft version that is. Uh, we're still waiting uh, for the HSM to be released before we're able to update the presentation materials to match exactly what you're going to see in the Highway Safety Manual. But we've been assured that the methodology and the factors have not changed. But there may be a change in some of the exhibit numbers and table numbers. Also, you'll see in some of the charts here in this 
uh, session and also in the next session that some of the factors are noted as AMF or accident modification factors. Uh, that has been changed. Uh, what you will see in the final HSM is that AMF have been changed from AMF to CMFs, which are crash modification factors. So just to make a, a clarification here up front so that you know uh, what you see here may be a little bit different from the actual highway safety manual you get a copy of it. Intersections are noted as uh, physical areas or functional areas. Um, they're basically the definition of an intersection is where two or more roadways join or cross each other. And both of these um, types of intersections um, have a physical and a functional area. And the definition of crashes vary between agencies. Some agencies uh, will define an intersection crash as one that occurs within the intersection physical area, which could be the crosswalk limits or the end or beginning of the intersection radii. And other agencies have specified a specific distance, for example, 250 or 200 feet from the center of an intersection for a crash to be classified as intersection related. A functional area of an intersection basically has three elements. The first is the decision site, uh, not decision site, but decision distance where the driver has to make a decision of what he's going to do before reaching the intersection. The second element is the maneuver distance where the driver positions himself where he needs to be to make the maneuver that he wants to make throughout the intersection, whether it's a through move or a turning move. Then there's also the third element, which is the queue or storage distance for stopped vehicles. What you see here is the default proportions of action, accident or crash severity levels. And they're used in the Highway Safety Manual to separate the accident or crash frequencies by type and by severity level. And you can see that they're listed as the percentage of total crashes for three-legged stop control, four-legged stop control, and four-legged signalized intersections. And you can see that the total is the total of fatal plus injury crashes and PDO crashes for each of these, three-legged stop control, four-legged stop control, and four-legged signalized intersections. This table here represents the default values for the highest percentage of collision types for each type for three-legged. The highest percentage of crash types are rear-end collisions. For four-legged stop control, the highest percentage is angle collisions. And for signalized intersections, again, it is the rear-end collision types. And these may be used to separate the crash frequencies by collision types. There's three basic steps for predicting a crash frequency using the methodology in the Highway Safety Manual. The first step is to use the safety performance function to come up with a predicted crash frequency for a given set of base conditions. The second step is to apply appropriate crash modification factors that will be discussed in the next session by Fred. And what the crash modification factors does is it adjusts the predicted safety performance from base conditions to existing conditions or proposed conditions. CMF value of less than one, you would expect a lower potential for crash frequency. And CMFs that have values greater than one, you would expect an increased potential for crash frequency. And the third step in predicting crashes is calibrate. And you can calibrate the safety performance functions that you've used and the crash modification factors to come up with a predicted value 
What that does is that accounts for local conditions. Appendix C in the Highway Safety Manual has a detailed process that walks the user through the calibration process. For rural two-lane intersections, there's three safety performance functions that are used, and it's based on the type of intersection. You have a three-approach or three-legged stop control intersection, and we have a safety performance function for a four-approach or four-leg stop control. And then we have a safety performance function for signalized four-way approach control. For a three-leg stop controlled intersection, this is the safety performance function. It's a exponential function, and it's also a function of traffic volume. It's traffic volume on the major road and the traffic volume on the minor road or the crossing road. Four-legged two-way stop controlled intersection also has its own safety performance function that looks very similar to the one for three-legged stop controls. They just have different factors, but the same variables, which are ADT on the major road and on the minor road. And the ADT is the average annual daily volume of traffic and vehicles per day for both the major road and the minor road. The third and final safety performance function is for four-leg signalized intersections. Again, exponential function based on traffic volume. Again, the ADT is the total vehicles per day on the major road and on the minor road. These are the base conditions that are set for rural two-lane intersections. And the base conditions do not represent any type of safety. They were selected based on statistical reasons. They are the approximate values or the mean values of the variables that were in the database that was used to develop the safety performance functions. And base conditions are that for intersection skew angle, we're assuming that the intersections are 90 degrees of each other, meaning there's not any skew angle, that there's not any presence of left turn lanes nor right turn lanes, nor is there any intersection lighting. Here's an example. We have a three-leg intersection stop on the minor road, and we're going to come up with the predicted number of crashes using the safety performance function. The ADT on the major road is 5,000 5, vehicles per day, and the ADT on the minor road is 500 vehicles per day. So here's our safety performance function for three-leg stop-controlled intersections. ADT, 5,000 on the major road, 500 on the minor road. Substituting those values into our safety performance function. Going through the calculation process, we come up with 0.9 crashes per year, or about 4.6 crashes every five years. This is for base conditions, assuming that there's no presence of right turn lanes nor left turn lanes. There's no intersection lighting, and that the intersection is at 90 degrees of the, each other. This graph is a representation, a graphical representation of the safety performance function, but it's also a representation that we can make a comparison to crash rate, because a lot of agencies use crash rates as a comparison for, for determining whether an intersection is safe or unsafe. The problem with crash rates are that they're linear, and they don't 
vary as a function of ADT. The highway safety performance function better conform to the observed crash frequency based upon exposure or traffic volume. The brown line being, being the crash rate, which stays consistent, doesn't fluctuate with traffic volume. So if we have a crash frequency that comes up where the red X is shown, which is about a little more than six crashes per year, is this a high crash frequency site? Well, it depends. You can see that the traffic volume we're comparing to is 5,000 vehicles per day, and it, the number is above the curves for those traffic volumes. So at first thought, first impression is yes, the crash is above the curve, so it is a higher level of crash frequency, but there are ways to bring this X back down into um, actual more relative terms, and that's through the use of the crash modification factors, also through the calibration process, to bring your values closer that are more relative to the actual representation of the crashes that are occurring. The second example is for a four-legged intersection with stop control on the minor road. It has annual daily traffic of 9,000 vehicles per day on the major road. On the minor road, 4,500 vehicles per day. What is the predicted number of crashes? Using our safety performance function for a four-leg stop control intersection, substituting in our variables for our major road traffic volume, 9,000 vehicles per day and 4,500 vehicles per day for a minor road. And running through the calculation process, we come up with 7.7 .7 crashes per year. This is for base condition. Again, this is a graphical representation of the safety performance functions. Again, the average crash rate is used by some states. Uh, the problem with it, as we said before, it doesn't account for the varying traffic volumes. So a more relative or a more actual application for coming up with crash prediction is through using the safety performance functions in the highway safety manual. So if we were to have a crash site or a predicted number of crashes where the red X is for a, predict for a predicted traffic volume, say 9,000 vehicles per day, your first impression is that yes, it is higher than what the predicted value is, but through the use of the crash modification factors and the calibration process, we can bring it more, make it more relative to the actual observation that's taken place. Our final example is for a signalized intersection. We have a four-way signalized intersection. We have the same traffic volumes on the major road and on the minor road. Major road traffic volumes, 9,000 vehicles per day. Major road, that is, excuse me. And the minor road is 4,500 vehicles per day. What is the predicted number of crashes? Again, using the safety performance function for four approach signalized intersection. Substituting in our values for our traffic volume. Come up with a predicted potential of crash frequency of seven and a half crashes per year. This is the graphical representation of safety performance functions for four-leg signalized intersections. Again, it's just to show that the um, if you have a location that has a higher crash frequency, then if you're above the plotted curve, then your first impression is that you are having a location 
we are having a higher than expected crash frequency than expected, but that can be adjusted using crash modification factors in the calibration process. So in this particular session, we did um, walk through the, briefly through the quantitative safety research on intersections. Uh, we showed you and demonstrated the application of the safety performance functions using base model conditions to come up with a predicted number of crashes for base conditions. And this applies for rural two-lane highway intersections. Other types of intersections, multi-lane intersections, have their own safety performance functions. But this particular session or webinar today, we're talking about rural two-lane highway intersections. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Fred to start the session on crash modification factors. Thanks, Gene. Fred Rank again. And one of the questions that did come up in the chat pod is, is there an equation to predict the crash frequency for a three-approach signalized rural intersection? The answer is yet no at this point in time. I will share with you that in one of the earlier drafts of the Highway Safety Manual, there was such an equation proposed. But the data set was so small, it could not be, it could not be statistically uh, used if it wasn't as robust and with the highest level of confidence needed to go into the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, hopefully, in the future, and remember that this edition of the Highway Safety Manual is a major, major step forward. Hopefully in the next edition, we will have a CMF and an SPF for three approach uh, T intersections that are signalized, just as we have in this first edition for stop control. And one of the things to clarify is that on the three approach stop control, there's only one stop sign on the stem of the T. And for the four approach stop control, that's two stop signs on this minor side road streets. In applying crash modification factors for two-lane rural intersections, we're going to describe the CMFs that are available for rural highway two-lane intersections and apply them with examples that you can build upon and use. Um, the, the information for rural highway intersections is fairly extensive and fairly robust. There are some aspects of the Highway Safety Manual that are less robust, that we know less about. But we do know an awful lot with great assurity about two-lane rural highway intersections. The portions of the Highway Safety Manual that are not robust in the first edition are interchanges for freeways. In fact, they're not even included as a chapter in Part C on predictive methods. They are included in a chapter in Part D of some information Hopefully in a future edition, because the research is being carried out now, they will have their own separate chapter in Part C. Uh, so in the first step in looking at a location is to predict the crash frequency. And Gene covered that very well in the previous session. And the second step that I'm going to cover in this session is we're going to apply the appropriate crash modification factors for that location. And keep in mind that a crash modification factor is used to adjust the predicted crash frequency from the base conditions to the actual conditions either existing for the location or the proposed design for that location. A CMF had, that is less than 1.0 would be expected to reduce the crash frequency, or it, it, let's put it this way, it has the potential to reduce the predicted crash frequency. Those that are greater than one, and there are quite a few, will have the potential to increase crash frequency. So what's a crash modification factor? It's an estimate of the effect on crash frequency of a particular geometric aspect or traffic control element or the effectiveness of a particular treatment or condition. And Gene and I have identified several already for you, such things as left turn lanes for a rural intersection, lighting, warning signs, 
uh, are just a few of them. An example it would be a CMF of 0 0.80 would be a crash modification factor of 20% fewer crashes for that element. Here's some news for you. In the publication of the Highway Safety Manual, ASHTO has used, standardized the term to be crash modification factor or CMF. Most of the literature, most of the research, and in fact that all of the drafts of the Highway Safety Manual prior to the publication by ASHTO use the term AMF. In fact, it will be changed in this final edition to be CMF. The term crash reduction factor will become CMF also, but stated rather than a percentage of crashes reduced in terms of the uh, expected crash uh, reduction as a decimal value. FHWA has already done the work to redo the crash reduction clearinghouse to become the crash modification clearinghouse. So if you go online, what you will already see in the work from uh, FHWA is that the, the clearinghouse is in terms of crash modification factors. Those CMFs of the highest quality are the ones of the Highway Safety Manual. That's how they were selected to be in the Highway Safety Manual, and you'll find them shown with that high quality of rigor in the CMF clearinghouse. And that CMF clearinghouse is available online. You just go to Crash Modification Factors Clearinghouse, and clearinghouse is all one word and you'll find it, uh, uh, find it online. So crash modification factors, they're used to adjust the safety performance function, prediction of crash frequency, to account for the differences between the assumed base conditions for rural two-lane highway intersections and what you actually have for your location or for your proposed design that you're considering. If it's a CMF of 1.0, it's the same as the base conditions, and you expect no change or effect in the cra on the expected crash frequency. A CMF of less than 1.00 means that the treatment reduces the expected crash frequency. Greater than 1, you would expect a crash frequency to increase. So the effect of a crash modification factor is 1 minus the CRF or crash reduction factor divided by a 100. A crash reduction factor of 18% would be a CMF of 0.82. A crash reduction factor of negative 23 would be a crash modification factor of 1.23. In terms of the Highway Safety Manual, CMF equals AMF. So here are the known effects that you can apply to two-lane rural highway intersections. First of all, configuration is very, very important. That is the number of approaches to an intersection. Uh, the angle or skew of an intersection, left and right turn lanes, and lighting and access near intersections. Price frequency for intersections with more than three approaches, such as the six-approach intersection of a US marked uh, route, are greater than for those intersections with only three approaches. Three approaches is the intersection of the lowest number of conflict points. We know that the crash frequency for intersections with four approaches are greater overall than for those with only three approaches. When you compare four-leg and three-leg intersections, cross intersections have 32 conflict points a T has 9, a pair of offset T's has 22. For skew, some studies showed adverse effects of skew. Skews increase exposure time. They increase the difficulty of driver view of a stopped approach. For, to, so you, you understand intersection angle and skew and how they're related to each other. For an intersection angle of 35 degrees, the skew is the difference between 90 degrees to our approach highway, and then subtract the intersection angle. So the degree amount of skew in this case is uh, six is uh, 90 55 degrees. If our intersection angle is 35, then subtract from 90 would be 55.
TMS for intersection skew vary, whether it's three-legged or four-legged. EXV is naturally skew is the number of degrees of the skew angle. Uh, for 90 degree four approach, the effects are shown in this exhibit, and this comes from NCHRP 500 Strategy 17.1 of the ASHTO 500 series guidebooks. 15 degrees has a 1.08 CMF, or 8% more crashes. By 30 degrees of skew, we're up to 1.18 for the CMF, or 18% more crashes. For this reason, and based on research, FHWA and its older driver handbook, and ITE and their intersection channelization guide, both recommend that skew be limited to 15 degrees. The Ashto Green Book still shows that a maximum skew up to 30 degrees can be used. But you need to understand that the effect of skew at 30 degrees is 18% more crashes. To illustrate this, we have an intersection at 90 degrees of intersection with the uh, major road, a cross intersection at 45 degrees, at 80 degrees on a T and 75 degrees with a T. In applying the equations for skew, we can calculate what the CMFs associated with B would be. For 90 degrees, there's no skew. So EXP raised to zero is E raised to zero and a CMF of 1.00. The crossroad at 45 degrees would be 45 degrees of skew. Uh, that is a significant outcome that the CMF is 1.275 or 27.5% more crashes for a crossroad at 45 degrees of skew. 10 degrees of intersection would be uh, 80, 80 degrees of, of intersection angle would be 10 degrees of skew or about a 4% effect. 75 degrees of intersection angle would be a skew of 15 degrees or about a 6% difference. Now those are of T's for number three and number four. And you can see how they differ from the information I provided to you two slides previously for a cross intersection. Some solutions to skewed intersections in the rural environment are on the upper right, what would we would call a classical green book illustration of a new alignment to take the skew out of the intersection and bring it in more orthogonally. These involve typically lots of right of way and a relocation of the road. A more elegant example comes from Washington State near Seattle in the lower left where the new alignment, the new alignment essentially uh, cuts across the extreme skew and comes out nearly at right angles to the major state highway and then it was signalized in combination with turn restrictions at the old skewed alignment with the state highway. If you have to have an intersection within a curve, try to locate it as close to the midpoint of the curve to uh, provide the greatest amount of sight distance and to allow you to bring the, inner, the side road in at nearly a right angle as possible to reduce any skew. Left turn lanes, as we've already stated, are for to remove the vehicle that's slowing and stops on the main for traffic from the through lanes, gives a place for that left turner to position themselves out of the high speed through lane in order to select a safe gap to make the left turn. The crash modification factors for left turn lanes are major, have major safety effects. For a four leg intersection, for minor road stop control, that is a two way stop of a four approach intersection, um, the, num the CMF value is a large one. Let me go back to that slide. And that value for two approaches uncontrolled for minor road stop control is a CMF of 0.52. That is a 48% crash reduction. Left turn lanes in the rural environment are one of the largest, most significant geometric measures that can be t installed in a project to reduce total crashes. Also, the effect is known 
but the amount of research continues to be limited and in terms of total sites that have been able to be studied. We do know that when we use a positive offset to left turn lanes, we certainly help older drivers in particular from the older driver handbook research and provides a safer, better point for a driver to make a safe selection of the gap in the high speed oncoming traffic. Sub research published in the latest uh, NCHRP report within this last month shows that positive offset left turn intersections for configuration of left turn lanes uh, in Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin uh, can reduce crashes of left turning vehicles for rural expressways up to 70%. We know it improves sight distance. However, do not expect that to show up in the first edition of the Highway Safety Manual. Hopefully it will be in the second edition. We also know that rural bypass lanes are certainly cost less than a conventional in the middle of the road alignment left turn lane. At low volume intersections, they may be just as effective. Howard Preston, in working for Minnesota DOT in the study of bypass lanes, was unable to conclude that bypass lanes were just as safe as left turn lanes centered on the alignment of the two lane roadway. For right turn lanes, they remove the slowing traffic for the right turn from the through speed, uh, high speed lanes that are not controlled. The CMFs, which are shown as in Exhibit 10-22 as AMFs, but they're CMFs, uh, for a four leg intersection minor road stop control, right turn lanes on two approaches have a CMF of 0.74 or a 26 percent uh, uh, crash reduction. Please note for the four leg intersection that when you go to traffic signal control from a two way stop control for of a cross intersection, the CMF is 0.92. That's a only an 8 percent reduction in, in total crashes. There is a big effect between the type of control being stop control to that of signal control. We do know that there is some research that the benefits of using a positive offset to the right turn lane, this effect is not yet in the Highway Safety Manual first edition. However, we know that some studies and by state DOTs such as Iowa and Kentucky have found a, if a, an effect and known to the geometrics. We know it improves sight distance. We know that it certainly helps drivers in making that left turn maneuver to know if the semi on, that's conflicting coming from their left is coming through or if he's over in the offset right hand turn lane, he's obviously making a right turn. There is a known CMF for lighting of rural two lane intersections. This is the fourth of the crash modification factors for intersections. The, it does vary by the type of intersection type, whether it's three approach stop control, four approach stop control, or four approach signal. And that's for a, for a uh, CMF of 0.65 for a rural stop controlled intersection, it would be about a 35% reduction in total crashes. The thing about the major effect of lighting is it's First of all, it addresses the issue of being able to see conflicting and approaching vehicles at night when uh, they're not visible. The, we know that travels less at nighttime. Typical amount of exposure at nighttime is around 28% of all travel, and we would expect the number of crashes to be less than during the day. So the highway safety manual is in terms of total crashes. So we don't see that big of an effect of overall of lighting uh, because we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with total crashes which include daytime as well as nighttime. The example for a four approach two way stop controlled intersection. And remind let's go back, we expect the night the effect to be about a thirty five percent nighttime total crash reduction. When we put this over in terms of total crashes in the highway safety manual and apply for a four approach two way stop control, we see that the effect is only about a CMF of 0.907 or 
or about 9.3% uh, 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 reduction in total crashes, even though the proven safety effect for reduction of nighttime crashes is around 35%. And this, um, the Highway Safety Manual is structured so that you can see the effects in total crashes and not just targeted crashes that you may have been dealing with previously. If you sum all of the CMFs to multiple intersections to adjust for their conditions or for their proposed improvements, you can, and this example is for three intersections by various types of traffic control, we can sum to see that the net effect, even though our predicted crash frequency was 5.26, after we've adjusted for skew, left and right turn lanes and lighting, the adjusted predicted crash frequency is 2.09 for all three intersections. And we show you this as an example of how you can combine the net effects of crash frequency adjusted by CMFs for a sum of intersections and a segment of highway. Some additional crash modification factors that are in the chapters in Part D and from other research outside of the Highway Safety Manual, uh, we're going to discuss roundabouts, four-way stops, and driveways and access within 250 feet of an intersection. Roundabouts are an alternative to conventional intersections in terms of geometric design. We know they reduce the number of conflicts. We, we eliminate the severe angle conflict. And we know that they geometrically control and regulate speed of travel through them. And controlling speed through an intersection is associated with fewer crashes. Not in Part C of cha in Chapter 10 on rural two-lane intersections, but over in Chapter 14 are CMFs associated with converting a signalized intersection to a modern roundabout. And you'll notice that it's a big effect. Uh, a CMF of 0.52 is a 48% reduction in crashes. Also, the effect of converting a stop-controlled intersection to a modern roundabout. For rural one lanes, this is one of the biggest CMFs in terms of safety effect in the entire Highway Safety Manual. A CMF of 0.29 is a crash reduction factor of 71%. That is no small safety effect. An example, and this is from Kansas in the Paola intersection of five approaches, converting the always stop over to a, a, a roundabout, we would expect from the known crash uh, performance in the Highway Safety Manual to see a reduction in crashes to a CM by a CMF of 0.29 or 71% for a single lane roundabout, which is the case for this location, if it was a multi-lane roundabout we see less safety effect because we're accommodating more volume. An example of a single lane roundabout in a small width footprint and right away is from Summit County, Ohio, built within a 60 foot meets 60 foot right away. And there is a drainage channel that runs diagonally from the upper left of this photo to the near lower right. The before information was 12 crashes with four fatal injury crashes in the two years prior. The after was four crashes total with zero fatal and injury. This is very typical safety performance associated with a single lane roundabout in the rural environment. The, there is a CMF for the conversion of a two-way stop to an all-way stop. Please keep in mind that we had an equation an SPF equation to predict the safety of performance for a three approach with a stop at the T and for a four approach with two-way stop. This CMF allows us to then a factor a to always stop control for either a three or a four approach intersection. And it's a major effect in terms of reduction in crashes. In terms of driveways and access near rural intersections, a driveway or access point within 250 feet either side, upstream or downstream of an intersection, results in more crashes. From research, we know that unsignalized intersections have 20% more crashes for three driveways within 250 feet. For signalized, 
13% more crashes. So this is the safety support to consolidate multiple access points and to relocate access points to its adjacent sides of the road if possible. This information is not in the Highway Safety Manual. It is beyond. However, it's from TTI's Road Safety Design Synthesis that was developed for the Texas DOT version of the Highway Safety Manual. For, there are two different equations, one for unsignalized, one for signalized, where three is the default value for the number of driveways either side of the road within 250 feet of the intersection. An example, for four driveways on a U.S. route, three on the county route intersecting near the rural intersection, we would plug seven in for the number of driveways, subtract three for the default value for a total of four, and the effect, as you can see, is rather large. A CMF of 1.25 has the meaning of a potential increase by 25% additional crashes. So in summary for our review question for this third module is what's the safety effect of left turn lanes? The basis for left turn, left turn lanes in the rural two-lane highways is in fact safety and it's because the known safety effect of left turn lanes for minor road stop control, two approaches uncontrolled of a CMF of 0.52, one of the larger CMFs or safety effects in the entire highway safety manual. So in this third session, we've described to you the known CMFs for rural two-lane highway intersections and applied them to predicted crash frequency uh, to illustrate to you how to use the highway safety manual. At this point, I'd like to open up the the Brad, uh, Brandon, if you as the operator for today's webinar, if you'd be so kind, let's open up the lines and answer questions, and then we'll start with the questions in the chat box after we've taken the call-in questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Please unmute your phone and record your first and your last name. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment, please, for our first question. Please feel free to join in with questions, and then I'll take up the questions in the uh, chat box. Looks like we have our first question. One, one moment, please. Sorry, Sean Coyle, your line is now open. Yes. Um, Question on intersections on curves. Uh, is there a negative uh, crash reduction factor having uh, intersections on curves? I, I didn't see anything uh, to that effect. You know, with the uh, perception uh, problem with drivers approaching, and also the super elevation and the amount of super elevation that may have on vehicles and trucks entering the intersection. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'll try and answer. And the answers to each of those three questions regarding to uh, intersections on curves, super elevation rate in trucks, is that the Highway Safety Manual doesn't yet contain that level of detail that we would be able to adjust the predicted crash frequency by any of those three effects. We do know that we can calculate the crash rate, predicted crash rate for a curve. And overall, that crash rates on curves as a function of the degree of their curvature and super elevation rate are about three times higher than for the same piece of two-lane roadway that would be a level straight tangent section. But in regard to available site distance and super elevation of the highway and a curve through an intersection, there is not any information at this point in time in the highway safety manual. 
Gene, would you like to add anything further? I think you did well, Fred. <laughs> Are there additional questions, Brandon? We have no further questions at this time. Okay, thanks, Brandon. And what I'd like to do is uh, work through the questions in the chat pod. Gene's been very good and helpful while I was chatting and while I was uh, well, I was presenting. He uh, answered many, many of your questions, and I tried to do the same while he was presenting session two. Let's go through some of the questions and the answers. Uh, the in terms of where the highway safety manual can be acquired, it is only from AASHTO at this point in time. I do believe that ITE is also offering it, but you can order the AASHTO Highway Safety Manual uh, from online through the AASHTO bookstore. In terms of what does the term relative safety mean? Um, darn good question from Gill of New York State. Um, relative safety probably best means is we would predict a fewer crashes uh, for one treatment versus another from having a certain geometric effect or not having it. And the way to quantify that is in the potential for reduced crash frequency. Uh, upon advice of uh, Jay Smith of Missouri DOT uh, to AASHTO in terms of uh, legal opinions on how to use the uh, highway safety manual and just how, what does relative safety mean? Jay puts them in terms of uh, reduced potential for crashes or potential for reduction in crash frequency. And I think that's probably about as good a way of putting it as I know of. Um, Stephen Strength from Louisiana DOT, if that's the same Stephen Strength that I've dealt with over the years, and as a district engineer, he really does a good job in working on intersections, posed the question, are there CMS for right turn treatments, such as channelization with different angles of incidence to the cross street? The answer is no, not in this first edition of the Highway Safety Manual. We do know that there is strong and good research out of Australia that says the best angle to bring in a right turn lane to a cross street is 55 to 60 degrees that reduces the skew angle for the driver uh, to an optimum level and reduces crashes for right turn lanes. We know that the big sweeping radiuses that bring it in nearly parallel to the side street have the highest crash rates. Um, the second part of Steve's question was parallel acceleration lanes. There is no information I know of, and it's certainly not in the first edition of the Highway Safety Manual on the uh, performance of parallel acceler acceleration lanes associated with uh, right turn lanes in, in the cross street. Uh, Brian Arcan uh, posed the question, is this the same as the second webinar? in terms of session one on information on overall highway safety and nominal and substitute safety? And the answer is no and yes. It's not an exact copy. The illustrated examples and the information for rural two-lane highway intersections are particular and unique to just this portion of overall highway safety. Uh, previous sessions that we've done on two-lane rural roads had commonality, but Webinar number three on HSM applications to urban suburban was just for that type of roadway. Um, and the, but the information uh, on nominal uh, safety and uh, substantive safety was tailored just to rural two-lane road and examples. Let's take the next question that was posed in the chat pod. Are there CMS for two intersections within 30 feet, or would that be considered a multi-lane approach? Uh, for the Highway Safety Manual, if they're separate intersections, you treat them separately. The Highway Safety Manual, really need, you need to think functionally when you apply it. And don't think too long. Probably your first choice is probably the correct way of approaching it. 
paging back up the chat pod to find out where we left off. Uh, Jennifer Devon asks, can the four-leg signalized SPF also be used for three-leg signalized? And the answer is no. Uh, they are separate performance functions. Although in the draft there was a highway safety manual, there wasn't a SPF for a three-leg signalized. The amount of data wasn't sufficient enough to have enough rigor to be included in the final edition. Next question, I believe, in the chat pod is, can these crash prediction calcs be done by hand, or is there software that is required for Madam Fricky? And the answer is, there are Excel spreadsheets available, and the will, Gene and I have them in the file share pod that we'll post in the wrap-up room as we conclude today's webinar. Uh, they're also simple enough and, and easy enough to deal with format in terms of a minimal amount of information needed to do the calculations that you can do them by hand. But uh, you may choose to use the Excel spreadsheet. At this point in time, there is not yet any software other than that in IHSDM, which has been expanded to take in more than rural two-lane roadway and roadway intersections in its overall software. Uh, in Palmer, it asks the question, does the equation currently handle a turning roadway through a two intersection with the, where the minor volume is one of the top portions of the T and not the SAM? And the answer is yes, because that type of distribution of volume and approach and operation was included as a not untypical uh, configuration in the overall data set from which the SPF was uh, developed for T intersections. Uh, Gil from New York State posed the question, does it work if the greater ADT is the stem and one leg of the main road? Uh, the answer to your question is that the larger of the ADTs always goes in for ADT major, and the smaller of the ADTs goes in for minor. If, in this case, if the greater ADT was in fact the same value for the stem and for one, one leg of the main road, then the two values would be the same as you insert them into the SPF equation. Stephen Strength posed the question, will there be any flow charts to help us sort through all this? And actually there are. They're in the Highway Safety Manual itself. They're in the steps by step how to do the, cal the example calculations within the Highway Safety Manual. From MTQ-DEM from Quebec DOT, does the ADT value for a three-leg intersection include both directions from the STEM approach or only the incoming traffic? This is a good question. And the answer is straightforward, that all traffic values are in terms of daily volume, and that is two-way volume. It's daily uh, volume total for the day, which we equate with average daily traffic, or AADT, if you're factoring for average day of the week for the year. It's a two-way traffic value. The HSM does not require you to have traffic in the form of peak hours or of entering volumes. It's totally in terms of overall daily volume for that approach for the 24-hour average weekday. From Altec. How often would the HSM be updated and would the factors be updated in between manual updates? Okay, the first, they're already working on the next edition. We have, there are many people have worked to identify the holes in the Highway Safety Manual first edition. Um, that work is ongoing already. Secondly, new CMFs are being added as new research is uh, being completed and reviewed, and those are posted in the CMF Clearinghouse, which we pointed to you as an online source of safety mod crash modification factors. So the answer is yes and yes. Let's see if I can get back up to where we were in the chat by a lot of questions. 
from North Carolina DOT. Is rural defined functionally or by volume thresholds? Functionally, please. The, if you think it's rural, it's probably rural for the purpose of analysis. And rural is the AASHTO definition of outside of an area of 5,000 or more population. If it looks rural, it's probably operating rural. Can you have a rural intersection within an urbanized area? And the answer is yes. Um, this is a qualitative assessment more so than any other way in determining what's rural or urban. And there are separate equations for urban-suburban intersections from rural. From Hawaii DOT, any SPS or CMS available for roundabouts? And the answer is yes. And we provided them in this session, and they're in the Highway Safety Manual. From Brian Rising, is the in a five-year period, a typo on slide 2-14, the other equations result in crashes per year? And the answer is no. Many of the values of predicted crashes for lower volume rural two-lane highway intersections are down in the tenths of a crash per year. When you get down to less than a crash per year as a predicted value, it seems better and a better way to communicate, particularly with the public, if you'll put the number of crashes over in the crashes per five-year period. Uh, so 0.2 crashes would be one crash in a five-year period. Uh, from Casal, how can I calibrate the SHM provided SPS according to local conditions? Uh, the answer is use safety analyst for all the crashes in your area, and then based upon the results of safety analysts of all of your crashes, with all of the geometrics and all of the effects of geometrics and traffic operations, uh, you could then calibrate how the SPS would vary or be calibrated to your local area. It's our view, my view in particular, that it's going to be years before we have good, valid calibration of the SPFs and the CMFs in any one state or area of a state. And the simple fact of it is it takes a tremendous amount of evaluation, analysis of crashes over a long period of time to be able to develop an adjustment factor. The experience of several states so far is that they have coefficients for uh, to plug into the equations for signalized or stop control, and they differ to a degree from the ones that we presented to you, but they're the rigor is just not there because they don't have enough sites or locations or enough years of data. The advantage of the values in the Highway Safety Manual is they were put together, developed from large, large, large data sets of multiple states. And the spread of those states was huge, from North Carolina to Minnesota to California to Illinois to Texas. And as a result, they're very robust in representing most of the experience that you could ha have in your area. Uh, yes, you can develop your own calibration, but I would suggest to you to be, treat very careful, walk carefully, tread carefully, and make sure you have a statistically valid calibration factor. Daniel Carter posed the question, the CMF Clearinghouse uh, includes a wide range of CMFs. Some of them are not of high enough quality uh, to be included in the Highway Safety Manual. That doesn't mean they're not good enough to be used. It just means they didn't pass that very rigorous test and evaluation to go into the Highway Safety Manual. And hence the star rating of the CMS in that clearinghouse. Daniel Carter was good enough to post the exact URL up in the chat pod. District 4, Illinois. Do we have a CMF for hazards within the clear zone? And the answer is yes for roadways, for rural two-lane roads, and for urban, suburban, uh, multi-lane highways. Um, but we don't have it for intersections, per se. It's over found in the segments and crash prediction for segments. And you, I would urge you to participate in both the July 7th webinar coming up next week on HSM applications to multi-lane rural highways and applications to urban-suburban roads. 
that will cover this explicitly. <laughs> trying to get back to where we were in the chat pod. I believe we're at the question that came out of uh, Illinois District 4. That's Adam Fricky posed the question, are there any factors to account for less than adequate sight distance on one or more legs of the intersection? And the answer is no, not within the highway safety manual itself. There is some information available. And it is posted in the CMF Clearinghouse on uh, crash reduction factors, CMS, for less than adequate sight distance, but not within the HSM. Uh, Gil from New York DOT posed a question, can you ever have below one for an intersection CMF? And the answer is yes. Um, the, the intersection CMFs, when you add lighting, are always less than one for left turn lanes, for right turn lanes. Uh, and for no skew, those CMFs are always le one or less. I believe I've already answered the question from Gill of New York uh, DOT on two intersections within 30 feet. Jacobs. Uh, pose the question, are there CMS for roundabouts in an urban setting? And the answer is yes. And in fact, we'll cover those in next week's uh, inter, uh, webinars. And we also covered it in last week's multi-lane urban and suburban intersection webinar. From Preyful Sony, number of access points since closest to intersection play a major role in crashes. Is there any research paper which dwells upon this issue? And the answer is yes, and it's the Texas TTI synthesis on highway safety features uh, and related to driveways. And it's available from TTI if you go to their website and then pose the search for the uh, subject area that you've cited in your question. From Maine DOT, how is ADT taken into account with the calculation for CMF for driveways? Uh, it's not a factor of ADT. It's more, it is in terms of the number of driveways. The Highway Safety Manual, wherever possible, has tried to simplify the application of any CMF. And so the adjustment of the CMF itself for the volume of ADT is not recognized in the formula provided. From John Wetmore. Would the CMF for a road intersecting the outside of a curve as opposed to the inside of a curve uh, had differ? And the answer is not, and we don't know in the Highway Safety Manual. That is not taken into account as one of the known safety effects at this point in time. Josh Peters asked if, do we know if future versions of the HSM will be able to be acquired in installments? or are we going to have to get a whole new manual? I don't know how to answer your question. We're too early in the process. AASHTO has not indicated how they intend to issue future uh, updates to the Highway Safety Manual at this point in time. It's a major, major effort just to get out this first edition, and that's where they're focused in our conversations they have with Gene and I on the Highway Safety Manual. In Hawaii DOT posed a question, any CMS for medium, median acceleration in refuge lanes? No, not at this point in time. Yes, six. Please restate what was said about CMF for signal control versus stop control. Um, I'll certainly try. Um, overall, stop control intersections can be expected to have a lower crash frequency than for signal controlled intersections in the rural environment. Because signal control imposing slow on yellow and stop on red for traffic on the main line. And signal control, hence, that influences all drivers on main line to slow and stop on a recurring cycle length basis. And drivers err on yellow and red in making that correct decision. Altec, ATEC, asked, posed the question, how often would the HSM be updated 
and would the factors be updated in between manual updates? Um, ASHTO at this point in time has not indicated when the next update will be. We do know that there's a committee working on it to ident that's identified known needs and items of available research that could be used to update the HSM. Um, I would look right, right now to the crash modification clearinghouse and a new research study being posted there as the updates that you could use as your source. Uh, ATEC, another question. Does the HSM calculate expected roadway departure crashes for all types of roadway facilities? And the answer, which we'll find out in next week's webinars, is that it does for rural two-lane highways and it does for suburban urban arterials. And the surprise will be is when we do next uh, Wednesday's webinar on July the 7th for rural multi-lane. So please tune in and we'll provide you information. Gil from New York DOT, are there any CMFs related to animal crash uh, activity in two-lane rural segments? And the answer is no. Inherent in the database of all of the data used to develop rural two-lane highway SPFs are animal crashes. And everywhere in the United States, in every state, is about the same level of involvement with animals, primarily with deer. And it's somewhere around the 40% of all rural crashes across the country. They could not remove, nor did they choose to remove animal crashes out of the crashes in the data set from which the HSPS were developed. So they're inherent in it. North Dakota DOT, will any future webinars show how to calculate the EB expected average crashes? That's a very, very good question, and it is a subject that we're currently under study. We're currently considering on for a additional webinar on applications of the HSM that would show examples on how to use EB, that is empirical based methodology, if you have more than one year of crash history to adjust your predicted crash frequency after you've applied these CMFs to adjust your predicted crash frequency to be the expected crash frequency. And the terms that I've just used are those that are you identified in Part B of the HSM in Chapters 4 through 9. Um, from N. Palmer, any CMFs now or coming for road service conditions and weather differences? And the answer is no. Uh, there was no, uh, nothing was done to pull out snow, wet, dry as a condition, ice, out of the crashes in these huge databases from which the SPS were developed. So you now know two, two of the measures that were not specifically accounted for. We know weather is in effect. We know that animal crashes are in effect. But they were not removed out of the databases from which the SPS were uh, developed. Are there other questions uh, in related to the Highway Safety Manual applications this morning? If so, you may please, uh, 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 please raise your hand. I see that Gene's been kind enough to, in the middle of the screen, giving you our wrap-up session screen. And in the HSM webinar series presentations are today's presentations, as well as those from the previous webinars on June the 24th on Project ID, June the 22nd on Suburban Urban Intersections, and back on June the 16th on HSM application to two-lane rural road segments, and also the HSM introduction and overview back in June the 14th. Uh, also, the links to the recorded sessions uh, are posted in the pod in the upper right hand if you want to download and use that information. I'd like to call your attention in the upper part of the screen to our next webinar on rural multi-lane highways. It will be on July the 7th, not Tuesday after the 4th of July, uh, Monday, but on Wednesday, July the 7th. Uh, the starting time will be 11 a.m. Eastern, and we'll have about an hour and a half on rural multi-lane highways. The information is not quite as rich as it is for two-lane rural, 
uh, highways, nor as rich as for suburban, urban, and multi-lake. But it is a uh, but there is a lot known, and there's a lot of information that you can take away from uh, participating in this webinar. Hey, Fred. I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, we will leave this wrap-up room that you're in now. We'll leave that open so that those who want to download copies of the presentations uh, later, they don't have time today, they can come in. Uh, later on uh, this week and uh, download copies at that time. I see we have an additional question posted in the uh, chat pod from Leo Salvin. Is there a CMF for high-speed two-way left turn lanes along rural two-lane highways? And the answer is yes. And we covered it in the webinar back on June the 16th. And you can download that information if you download the webinar uh, PowerPoint for June the 16th, which is in the file share pod. You may page up and down in the file share pod to the, all of the PowerPoints, as well as the spreadsheets for calculations, as well as an HSM primer on the HSM itself are available in the file share pod. Uh, Adam Fricke asked, where are the calculation spreadsheets? And I'll point out to you they're in the file share pod. And let me page up to them, and I'll put them, I'll highlight one of them, which is intersection crash prediction uh, for total crashes. There's also the suburban urban multi-lane streets that was developed from the NCHRP panel that developed the two-day overview workshop. Uh, both of these are part of the information available. We will make the spreadsheet available for rural multi-lane next Wednesday when we conduct that webinar. 